Welcome back to the Great Compromise podcast. Today we're doing a learning about episode. We are learning about free speech as it pertains to social media. So let's start off by talking about what freedom of speech actually is. Generally speaking, it means that the government may not jail, fine, or impose civil liability on people or organizations based on what they say are right, except in exceptional circumstances. The key word here is the government. The First Amendment does not protect people, or rather freedom of speech, from anyone else, including individuals, organizations, private employers, colleges, or landowners, just to name a few. There are, of course, some situations that are not protected by the First Amendment. Defamation, true threats, fighting words, obscenity, and false commercial advertising, for example. That's exactly right, and I found the same thing in my research, that the First Amendment is about keeping the government from limiting free speech. Many countries do not give their citizens the right to speak freely, which is what our founders were trying to protect against. This means that if your boss tells you not to discuss religion at work, for example, that's perfectly legal, just as Twitter, a private company, can moderate their content and censor you. That is legal. It's not against the First Amendment. The First Amendment specifically prevents Congress from making laws that restrict free speech. The 14th Amendment, more specifically the State Action Doctrine and the Due Process Clause, extends this protection on free speech to states and local governments. This does not extend to private individuals or companies. So when Twitter bans you, your constitutional rights to free speech have not been violated. Exactly. That's, that's a little background on the law, but let's talk about more how it applies to these social media platforms. Because we're constantly hearing about freedom of speech, like, quote, violations online. And, like, particularly now that Elon Musk has purchased Twitter. You know, technically and legally speaking, social media users do not have the right to freedom of speech on these platforms. Um, the platforms are allowed to, like, remove any offending content when it violates their terms and conditions, like unilaterally. And so I guess now that leads us to this gray area, right? Why don't we have more, I guess some people are clamoring for more freedom of speech on these platforms. It seems like the internet, especially in the age of COVID, is like our only platform to even speak anymore. And so like, why should freedom of speech apply should it be heavily moderated? Like, what, where do we go from here? And, like, this brings us back to, like, the terms and conditions. Like, like, these platforms are writing these terms and conditions that we all agree to before we use them. But have you ever taken the time to read these terms and conditions? Not one time. Right. Like, has anyone? I, the average person, I would guess, has not. And so... Like, is Twitter taking advantage of that fact? Like, if they give you a 100-page doctrine to agree to before you sign up for Twitter, do they do that knowing that no one's going to read it and they can just take advantage of that? I mean, that definitely does concern me. Like, in the back of my mind, whenever I sign and, like, agree to terms and conditions, I'm, like, you know, not sure what has been snuck in there. And I think that's a possibility. But I also want to think about is freedom of speech something we actually want on social media like there are a lot of downsides to that like what inciting violence mm -hmm. bullying um racial slurs like there's a ton of stuff that we're protected against on purpose and that's only continued to develop over the last 10 years that twitter has been in existence right like at first there was a lot more free speech, you know, to use the term, even though that doesn't really apply to social yes, media. Right. Like, there was a lot more liberal use of, like, content curating, I guess, on, t on Twitter. Whereas now, like, because we had, like, people interfering with news and elections, basically Russia, like, in 2016 and stuff, like, all these companies have tried to adapt and change the rules from there. So do we really want to go back? Because we've ended up here for a reason. Yeah, I think most people would agree that there needs to be some amount of moderation done on these platforms. I know easier said than done. Like, where do we draw the line on that moderation, right? Like, even free speech 
it has to be moderated. Like, even the government says, okay, you have freedom of speech unless it's defamation, true threats, fighting words, obscenity, and false commercial advertising, right? Like, there are even limits on free speech, and so there there need to be some sort of limits online. I guess the question becomes what those limits are, who decides what they are, and who gets to enforce it, right? Right. I mean, I would assume that the companies get to decide depending on what their own reasons are per company. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that also does kind of turn into like a trend, right? Of like, because another company has done it, then another company might follow suit. You know, company B might say, oh, I like what they did there. I see where we're going on this Mm -hmm. societal trend of, of blocking certain, certain words and, and actions. Right. Okay. But what about, when one of these social media platforms starts to have a bias about who gets banned and what content is considered against terms of service. We're getting into a problem there. We get into a problem, and I think we've been at that problem. I'm going to use Twitter as an example, because that's kind of why we're talking about this today, right? We're we're talking about Elon buying Twitter and and what's next for that, and so we're just going to be referring to Twitter a lot, but... Way, way back in the year 2020, long, long, time ago. L- long time ago, the New York Post published an article about Hunter Biden's leaked emails and his laptop. You remember this story? I remember this. Right. It showed his shady dealings with overseas businessmen and the connection with his father, Joe Biden, who was VP at the time this stuff went down. Right. Of course, it also revealed Hunter had a drug and hooker problem, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> Regardless of the authenticity of the story, both Twitter and Facebook deleted these posts and any others sharing the story calling it disinformation. Do you remember that as well? I remember that it wasn't disinformation after all. Right. Um, Well, we know that as of like a month ago. (laughs) It's been, you know, certified and everyone knows it's true now, but... At the time, it was called disinformation, and Twitter went so far as to delete the New York Post account for two weeks. It's true, and it's been verified now, but and um, the Twitter's former CEO, uh, Jack Dorsey, himself admitted it was a mistake to delete the New York Post account. So, I mean, the New York Post has been around a long time. They, they're, I, I don't know how credible any journalism organization is these days, but they're just as credible as anybody else. Right. And they published a story in an election year, and it got deleted. And so, to me, that, that shows a little bias, personally. Or quite a lot of bias. Quite a lot of bias. And I can't think of anything like that happening to any of those fake stories that we've talked about happening, you know, about Trump. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen so many fake stories online. In fact, social media makes fake stories worse or they make them up and they spread them like that's the purpose of social media these days is to to publish fake stories and i just i don't know of an example of like a fake story putting a republican in a bad light that or rather a a whatever you know what i mean there's no example of like the same thing on the other side in fact the washington post still has tweets up about the fake russian bounty story i checked it this week Really? I did a deep dive. They still have tweets up about that fake story about the Russian bounties. They are up right now, and we know it is fake. (laughs) Years ago, we know it's fake. So, like, this is a clear case of bias. Yeah. And so, these platforms are, like, too big to fail at this point, right? And then the question becomes, like, what responsibility do they have in, in moderating? Are they going overboard? Are they biased? It seems to be a little bit true. Right. I think that moderation is not all bad, but it needs to be done equally, not to fit some agenda or desired outcome, because that's where this is becoming just ethically wrong. Quillette published a study in 2019, so this is a few years old at this point, I admit that, that said of the 22 prominent politically active individuals who have been suspended from Twitter, 21 of them were conservative. Whoa. And that was before Trump's ban, right? So there's a bias. Clearly. 
when we're we're talking about freedom of speech, quote unquote, it's never going to be true freedom of speech. But we can at least get it to a level where there's no bias, as much as humanly possible. There's always going to be a little bias, but we can do our best to get it to low to no bias. What is your prediction about how things might change on Twitter now that Elon Musk owns it? Do you think it's going to be less left-leaning? Because that's hard to believe. Yeah. Um, I don't think Elon is the libertarian hero that he's presenting himself to be. I think right? there's a lot of other motivation for buying Twitter than freedom of speech. Uh, obviously, <laughs> that's like not the driving cause of why he bought Twitter. He no. bought it to make a boatload of money in which he is going to make a boatload of money. Mm -hmm. And so, mission success. I don't think he is going to be involved in the day-to-day -day of running Twitter, and I don't think, he, unless it's like a really public problem that's happening, I don't think he's going to be involved in, you know, who gets banned on Twitter and who doesn't, because like... How could he have the time? He can't. Like, the CEO is not involved in these things. Like, they have, they have employees to do that. And so, him saying that he's going to bring freedom of speech back to Twitter isn't really realistic to, to me. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't think it's a promise he can really follow through on. It would at least be very difficult, right? He'd have to change the culture at the company. Um, and it's clear that the Twitter employees, at least, you know, seemingly do not like him. And so who knows if it's actually going to happen. An uphill battle. It's yeah. an uphill battle, yeah. What would you like to see him accomplish? Like, what do you dislike about Twitter besides everything? <laughs> Uh, everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I don't use Twitter very much yeah. because when I do go on, it's just really negative and mean. Um, mm -hmm. not my preferred way to spend my time. And right. So with moderation, by the way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I I guess it would be more appropriate to ask you that question since I know you use Twitter way more than I do. What are you hoping comes out of this? Or what changes would you recommend? I just want less bias, right? Like, I want there to be the same standard for the right as there is for the left. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying whether or not Trump deserved to be banned off Twitter. Maybe he did. But it was definitely a political decision. But, like, deleting these stories, these obviously, like, political stories that have or should have had consequences in an election year. Mm-hmm. It seems like they are playing a side, right? They get their their team to win. Mm -hmm. And obviously I don't want that anymore. I think that the entire trend of social media companies and newspapers and, like, journalist outlets playing a biased part in an election needs mm -hmm. to stop. Yeah. Like, journalism used to have integrity it used to be unbiased, and now it's difficult to even find one article where the author is not spouting personal opinion. Mm -hmm. And I'm just tired of it. Like, I want the news. I don't want your opinion. I don't want your bias. I don't want, like, what you think I should know about the story. I just want the story. There's blame on the, the journalists, and there's blame on the platforms that are allowing those stories. It's like they have so much power over our lives now, and we willingly gave it to them. But don't they have some obligation not to abuse that power? They should, but they're more interested in the financial outcome, you know, than the ethical incentive. That's just wrong. I think there needs to be maybe some road to how the... The public that is making these newspapers and social media outlets all their money can make wiser decisions to try and, like, create financial incentive for people to be working with more integrity and less bias. I mean, I, I just don't think that's going to happen. The genie's out of the bottle. Um, what is it that Trump just created this new truth platform as an alternative to Twitter? It has, like, ten users, and he's not even one of them. So... Like, it, it's too late. Like, these these social media platforms have a monopoly. We are only going to have Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, from now on. Like, these are, these are what we're stuck with. 
and this is what we have to use. Of course, the alternative of TikTok, which is moderated by the Chinese government, isn't really better. No. No. So, like, this is what we have. How should, like, the First Amendment be... Should the First Amendment be extended to cover these platforms? Or, like, the Internet in general? And, like, what are the consequences of that? I guess the question here is not, to me, should the First Amendment be extended to cover social media platforms? Because I still think that's dicey, trying to regulate private companies. Mm -hmm. I think that, as a country, we have a right to create... um, the space that, like, a company calls for. And then it's your decision whether or not you want to work for that company. Mm-hmm. It's your decision whether or not you want to use Twitter or be present on social media, right? Like, it's a business. I think they have a right to, um, to an extent, create what they're working towards there. I would more likely like to see some sort of standard on, like, ethical reporting and, like, cutting out bias and just focusing on the truth. Like, I want to see some kind of, like, rebirth in journalism where we're getting rid of all, like, the bad habits that have formed. Because social media turns into news. So I'm talking about, like, this this change needs to happen across news outlets and social media because they're so tied. I mean, now we're getting like articles based on what someone posted or, you know, it just turns into this whole mad tornado. And every news story breaks first on social media. Yeah. So it's important, right? We're, we're not just talking about a place where you can share memes online. We're, we're talking about where people get their information, which is why this is so important. It's become so integral to how companies behave and politics take place and the trends and the concerns of the country. I mean, like, social media is just huge now, and I don't think that anybody is really functioning and growing their company or their interests without a social media presence. So it it can't be just running wild. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, a lot of people get banned for harassment, racism, sexism, you know, the classic internet stuff. And those bans are justified. Like, I'm not yep. out here today saying we shouldn't ban anyone for any reason. No. Because that's that's just not good or realistic, right? It's just the problem I see is when these platforms are banning people for having different political opinions. They're, they're banning people for wrong, wrong think, you know? I don't agree with you, so I'm kicking you off. Right. And that is the problem. And maybe Elon will change that. I don't know how but it's he's claiming he's going to try well it's not like we have any other choice than to wait and see what happens anyway well, exactly. so i guess we'll wait and see what happens exactly we we all have to use it we're all tied to it and so we, we don't have a choice either way is it going to be this bastion for freedom of speech no i would no. be shocked if that happened Th- there's no way I think best case scenario for Elon taking over is he bans more bot accounts, which will help stop the spread of disinformation, and maybe he'll ban less people. But I think we're barely going to see any change at all, frankly. That would make sense. Like, that would make sense. I think a lot of people try to bring attention and excitement to change, and then that change never follows through. So it wouldn't be shocking if that's exactly what came of it. Right. And um, I have... I have to say, I have enjoyed the freak out on the left that Elon is taking over. There's been some panic, and I always, I always like that. <laughs> it's fun to watch. Yeah. It's fun to watch, and I, I eat that up. But uh, at the end of the day, I don't think much will change. No, no, unfortunately, I don't think so. Good or bad, right? Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of The Great Compromise. Ironically, we want you to like us and follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Send us a message. We can talk about freedom of speech there. Thanks, and we'll see you next week.